look for happiness. And everyone thinks, well, I'd rather be happy than miserable, and like, fair enough, you know. But there's nothing about that that has any nobility. And it's not believable. No one believes that because everyone knows that life is bounded by tragedy and that malevolence abounds. Everyone knows that. So, and you say, you know, so there's that terrible, there goes that terrible dark dyad of tragedy and evil and you wave the little flag of happiness in front of it. It's like, you know, no one believes that that will work. But then when you tell people, look, um, you're dark, you're a monster, you really are. And, but that's actually useful because you cannot survive the world without being a monster. People think, oh, oh well, that's interesting. I, I kind of suspected that I was a monster and everyone's always said that, that was bad. It is bad, obviously, but there's something that can be done about it and there's something that, we, that can be transmuted into something good without being inhibited. So you're saying, to be good, I don't have to be a neutered tomcat. To be good, I can be a monster, but I can be like a civilized monster. It's like, yeah, that's what you should aim at. You should be unbelievably dangerous. The more dangerous you are, the better. And then you should control that. Because that, that's your, your doctrine on what constitutes morality, right? It's contained capacity for malevolence. For, for mayhem. For mayhem. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, well, and I learned this partly from Jung, but also partly from Nietzsche. And of course, Jung learned it partly from Nietzsche because Nietzsche pointed out that most of what passes for morality is just obedient cowardice. Yes. So I'm an obedient coward. Well, no one wants to think that. So they say, well, no, I'm not an obedient coward. I'm a, I'm a, oh, I'm a good person because I don't break any rules. It's like, no, you're not. You're an obedient coward and you're too afraid to break the rules. That doesn't make you good. It also accounts for why the dark hero, you know, the anti-hero is so popular in, in cinematic representations in particular because people go and watch the mafia hitmen and guys like that. And, they, you know, the, there's a dark part of them that thinks, wow, you know, those guys are really cool. You know, like movies like Quentin Tarantino's movies, you know, yeah. um, where the hitmen are wisecracking and, you know, they're tough and they can handle any, everything. And you think, well, these guys are psychopathic criminals. Why are people looking up to them? It's because, well, you're not moral if you're just harmless. And the question is, well, what's the antidote to being harmless? And that's the antidote to that is to open up that doorway into the shadow. And then, then you could become that, right? There's that, that gleeful, predatory victory that's part of that. You know, the, and that would, be, that would be associated with, let's say, the attitude that I could have had to what happened with Channel 4. It's yeah. like, I won. Yeah. Look the fuck out. Right. But no, that's not right because it's, it's not good enough. It's better than losing by a lot yeah. because there's nothing in a loss that's admirable. But... It's not the highest form of victory. And there's no reason not to go for the highest form of victory. And that's peace. Yeah. Right? It's not predatory victory. It's peace. Because anyone with any sense, who has any wisdom, regards peace as the goal. And that isn't the peace that means that I'm so afraid of you that I'm not going to say anything. It's the peace that is that, like, it's the peace of armed opponents yeah. who respect one another. Right, that's real peace. I guess I'll tell you too, something about telling the truth. So one thing I did in 1985, 82, 83, 82, I, I swore that I would stop lying. I said, I'm going to try not to say anything I know to be untrue. You know, that doesn't mean I swore to tell the truth, because truth, that's hard. But you can consciously stop lying when you know you're lying. You can stop doing that. And that has been revolutionary for me. And, and one of the things I've really realized in recent years, and this is very much worth knowing, is that more, many times when people speak to each other, they have a, an agenda in mind. You know, you want something from someone. Maybe you want a job and you want to craft your image to get the job, right? So you say what you need to say to get what you think you need. The problem with that is, what do you know about what you need? You're so accurate about that, are you? And you think you know what you need exactly. And so you're going to falsify your utterances to bring about the desired end. And you're going to use the other person as a target of your manipulation. Well, that's like you write an essay because that's what the professor wants to hear. It's like you don't do that because you don't falsify your words because hypothetically they're divine. And the whole stability of the state rests on them hypothetically. And maybe really too. And so you don't do that. And so instead, you strive to tell the truth. And maybe that's an aim, too. And then it's an adventure. Because I'll tell you one thing. 
if you tell the truth, you have no idea what's going to happen to you. Because you have to let go of that. It's like, I'm going to say what I think. And then what I'm going to assume, faith, I'm going to assume that whatever happens, if I am telling the truth, is the best thing that could happen. Because the truth brings about what is best. And even if it looks hard for me, because it might be, you know, because people take the easy way out often when they lie, even if it looks bad for me, that doesn't mean it's bad. It just means I don't see the whole, I don't see the whole picture. And you know, if you believe that the truth will set you free and that there is such a thing as the truth and that the truth is redemptive, then you're pretty much stuck with that conclusion. But one of the remarkable things about that, and this really is worth knowing, is that if you do that, you will have your adventure. Right? The, that's the Abrahamic adventure. You know, the call from God that justifies your life because of the excitement of what you're doing. And the truth does that. And then if it's the truth, man, it's your adventure. Because what bloody adventure are you having if you tell someone else's story? It's not yours. And maybe if it's not yours, it's not good enough for you. And then you suffer, and then you're bitter, and then you're cruel, and then you're resentful. That's not good, or you get arrogant. So, so you break up your life, you know, into practicalities, your career, your education, your intimate relationship, your marriage, your friendship. Hopefully your intimate relationship and your marriage are the same thing. <laughs> your use of time outside work, your civic duty, you know, and you have develop an image for yourself, a vision for yourself on all those fronts and assume that you can have with the proper sacrifices what you need and want. And then I'll say something interesting about that because that's the pursuit of goods in a practical way, right? In what's valuable in a practical way, in an implementable way. And you pick those pathways and you dedicate yourself to their optimization along any of those axes. And then you learn to optimize an aim. And then you see, once you've learned to optimize an aim, across a set of goods, you start to aim at what is what unites those goods. Because what's, that's what makes goods good. It's whatever is common across a set of goods. That's the highest good or a higher good. And so by practicing any good, in any rigorous sense and making the proper sacrifices in that direction, you simultaneously learn to approach the good that is the sum or the essence of all those proximal goods. And I would say that the, the essential insistence in Christianity is that the good that unites all those goods is the same good that's reflected in the image of Christ, which is an image of acceptance of the suffering of life and the necessity of serving the lowest as the highest calling. And that's something, and it might be true. Like really, actually, 100% true, more true than anything else, and I actually think it is. If it is true, and if that is real, then why in the world would you ever attempt to do anything else? And it's kind of earth-shattering in some sense to take this with real seriousness, you know? It's all very frightening if you're not afraid by of that, of that vision, you know, and what it implies for you and your soul, then you didn't understand it. But it's also an unbelievably, what would you say, endlessly promising vision of what your life could be. And you know, you might think, well, I need a life so rich that I can justify its suffering. And that's really asking for something, because there's no shortage of suffering in life. And it's, no one thinks their own suffering isn't real. And maybe there's a possibility that there's some aim that's so high that, that the attempt that the attempt alone to move in that direction is of sufficient value to act as a panacea for the suffering. And so you could say at the end of your life, oh my God, that was so hard. It was worth it. And so that's the choice you make at the crossroads. If you have any sense, why don't you set your family right? You know, you need siblings. Maybe you don't have them. Set your relationship with your parents right. Fix your relationship with your father, with your mother, with your siblings. The same thing. And then what sort of relationship do you have with, want to have with your children? You know, if you could have what you wanted. I had a very good relationship with my children. My daughter, as I said, was very ill, so that made things complicated. But I had a great relationship and still do with my son. It's, it's one of the lights of our life. And we concentrated on making that relationship pristine. You know, both of us and my wife as well. And so imagine, well... I want my son to love me. I want my son to respect me and vice versa. I want a child who can make mature decisions. I want someone I can rely on. I want someone who other people gravitate towards. 
Because I can have what I want if I'm willing to make the proper sacrifices. And so that's, that's a good thing. Could you set your family straight? Well, you need a job or a career. So what can you offer? And what can you bring in the world in that regard? And, not, and then I would say, well, if you're thinking about career success in this Tower of Babel manner, then that's a temptation. But you might think, well, how much could, good could I do if I had the opportunity in the shortest possible period of time, if I went all in? And then, that's, there's a name, man, there's a name. And then you might think, well, what would that look like? You know, if I was a light to my community, if I was a light to the people I work with, who would I be if I was like that? And, and then you can conceptualize that and you can see when you deviate from it and why couldn't you con correct for the deviations and move towards that? And then you might say, well, you are you going to make productive use of your time outside of work? Productive and generous use of your time? Productive, generous, and meaningful use of your time. How about that? You're going to control your, your susceptibility to temptation? Regulate your alcohol and, and drug use? Because alcoholism takes out lots of people. Regulate your sexual temptation? You can control yourself for some reason that's worth controlling yourself for. You know, because there's something to being sybaritic. There's at least the momentary pleasure. It's not nothing. And you're not going to sacrifice that if you have any sense unless you sacrifice it to something clearly better.